Hi all. First of all I would like to thank all my critics for love and support. I am really sorry that in my last video I wasn't able to add sound effects. Hopefully you guys will like these audio sequences. Further I would like to request my listeners to please subscribe my channel and like the videos to support my efforts as a token of appreciation and encouragement so that I could keep my spirits and morale high in making enjoyable videos for all of you. Once again thanks for your support. Let's begin the today's story. The People Pani Tiger by Sir Jim Corbett. Beyond the fact that he was born in a ravine running deep into the foothills and was one of a family of 3, I know nothing of his early history. He was about a year old when, attracted by the calling of a cheetle hind early one November morning, I found his pug marks in the sandy bed of a little stream known locally as People Pani. I thought at first that he had strayed from his mother's care, but, as week succeeded week and his single tracks showed on the game paths of the forest. I came to the conclusion, that the near approach of the breeding season was an all-sufficient reason for his being alone. Jealously guarded one day, protected at the cost of the parent life if necessary, and set adrift the next, is the lot of all jungle folk, nature's method of preventing inbreeding. That winter he lived on peafowl, Kaka, small pig and an occasional cheetle hind, making his home in a prostrate giant of the forest felled for no apparent reason, and hollowed out by thyme and porcupines. Here he brought most of his kills, basking, when the days were cold, on the smooth bowl of the tree, where many a leopard had basked before him. It was not until January was well advanced, that I saw the cub at close quarters. I was out one evening without any definite object in view, when I saw a crow rise from the ground, and wipe its beak as it lit on the branch of a tree. Crows, vultures and magpies always interest me in the jungle, and many of the kills I have found both in India and in Africa, with the help of these birds. On the present occasion, the crow led me to the scene of an overnight tragedy. A cheetle had been killed and partly eaten and, attracted to the spot probably as I had been, a party of men passing along the road, distant some 50 yards, had cut up and removed the remains. All that was left of the cheetle were a few splinters of bone, and a little congealed blood off which the crow had lately made his meal. The absence of thick cover and the proximity of the road, convinced me that the animal responsible for the kill, had not witnessed the removal and that it would return in due course. So, I decided to sit up, and made myself as comfortable in a plum tree as the thorns permitted. I make no apology to you, my listeners, if you differ with me on the ethics of the much debated subject of sitting up over kills. Some of my most pleasant shikar memories, center around the hour or two before sunset, that I have spent in a tree over a natural kill. Ranging from the time when, armed with a muzzle loader whipped round with brass wire, to prevent the cracked barrel from bursting. I sat over a lungur killed by a leopard, to a few days ago, when with the most modern rifle across my knees, I watched a tigress and her two full-grown cubs, eat up the sambar stag they had killed, and counted myself no poorer for not having secured a trophy. True, on the present occasion there is no kill below me. But, for the reasons given, that will not affect any chance of a shot. Sent to interest the jungle folk there is in plenty in the blood-soaked ground, as witness the old grey-whiskered boar, who has been quietly rooting along for the past ten minutes, and who suddenly stiffens to attention, as he comes into the line of the blood-tainted wind. His snout held high, and worked as only a pig can work that member, tells him more than I was able to glean from the ground, which showed no tracks, his method of approach, a short excursion to the right and back into the wind, and then a short excursion to the left and again back into the wind, each maneuver bringing him a few yards nearer, indicates the cheetle was killed by a tiger. Making sure once and again that nothing worth eating has been left, he finally trots off and disappears from view. Two cheetle, both with horns in velvet, now appear and from the fact that they are coming downwind, and making straight for the blood-soaked spot, it is evident they were witnesses to the overnight tragedy. Alternately snuffing the ground, or standing rigid with every muscle tensed for instant flight, they satisfy their curiosity and return the way they came. Curiosity is not a human monopoly, many an animal's life is cut short by indulging in it. A dog leaves the veranda, to bark at a shadow, a deer leaves the herd to investigate a tuft of grass, that no wind agitated, and the waiting leopard is provided with a meal. 
the sun is nearing the winter line, when a movement to the right front attracts attention. An animal has crossed an opening between two bushes, at the far end of a wedge of scrub, that terminates 30 yards from my tree. Presently the bushes at my end part, and out into the open, with never a look to right or left, steps the cub. Straight up to the spot where his kill had been he goes, his look of expectancy giving place to one of disappointment as he realizes that his cheetle, killed possibly after hours of patient stalking, is gone. The splinters of bone and congealed blood are rejected, and his interest centers on a tree stump lately used as a butcher's block, to which some shreds of flesh are adhering. I was not the only one who carried firearms in these jungles and, if the cub was to grow into a tiger, it was necessary he should be taught the danger of carelessly approaching kills in daylight. A scatter gun and dust shot would have served my purpose better, but the rifle will have to do this time, and, as he raises his head to smell the stump, my bullet crashes into the hard wood an inch from his nose. Only once in the years that followed did the cub forget that lesson. The following winter, I saw him several times. His ears did not look so big now, and he had changed his baby hair for a coat of rich, tawny red with well-defined stripes. The hollow tree had been given up to its rightful owners a pair of leopards, new quarters found in a thick belt of scrub skirting the foothills, and young Sambar added to his menu. On my annual descent from the hills next winter, the familiar pug marks no longer showed on the game paths and at the drinking places, and for several weeks I thought the cub had abandoned his old haunts and gone further afield. Then one morning his absence was explained for, side by side with his tracks, were the smaller and more elongated tracks of the mate he had gone to find. I only once saw the tigers, for the cub was a tiger now, together. I had been out before dawn to try to bag a Ciro that lived on the foothills, and returning along a fire track my attention was arrested by a vulture, perched on the dead limb of a sal tree. The bird had his back towards me and was facing a short stretch of scrub with dense jungle beyond. Dew was still heavy on the ground, and without a sound I reached the tree and peered round. One antler of a dead samba, for no living deer would lie in that position, projected above the low bushes. A convenient moss-covered rock afforded my rubber shod feet silent and safe hold, and as I drew myself erect, the samba came into full view. The hindquarters had been eaten away and, lying on either side of the kill, with a pair, the tiger being on the far side with only his hind legs showing. Both tigers were asleep. Ten feet straight in front, to avoid a dead branch, and thirty feet to the left would give me a shot at the tiger's neck, but in planning the stalk I had forgotten the silent spectator. Where I stood I was invisible to him, but before the ten feet had been covered I came into view and, alarmed at my near proximity, he flapped off his perch, omitting as he did so to notice a thin creeper dependent from a branch above him against which he collided, and came ignominiously to ground. The tigress was up and away in an instant, clearing at a bound the kill and her mate, the tiger not being slow to follow, a possible shot, but too risky with thick jungle ahead where a wounded animal would have all the advantages. To those who have never tried it, I can recommend the stalking of leopards and tigers on their kills as a most pleasant form of sport. Great care should however be taken over the shot, for if the animal is not killed outright, or anchored, trouble is bound to follow. A week later the tiger resumed his bachelor existence. A change had now come over his nature. Hitherto he had not objected to my visiting his kills but, after his mate left, at the first drag I followed up I was given very clearly to understand that no liberties would in future be permitted. The angry growl of a tiger at close quarters, than which there is no more terrifying sound in the jungles, has to be heard to be appreciated. Early in March the tiger killed his first full-grown buffalo. I was near the foothills one evening when the agonized bellowing of a buffalo, mingled with the angry roar of a tiger, rang through the forest. I located the sound as coming from a ravine about 600 yards away. The going was bad, mostly over loose rocks and through thorn bushes, and when I crawled up a steep bluff commanding a view of the ravine the buffalo's struggles were over, and the tiger nowhere to be seen. For an hour, I lay with finger on trigger without seeing anything of the tiger. At dawn next morning I again crawled up the bluff, to find the buffalo lying just as I had left her. The soft ground, torn up by hoof and claw, testified to the desperate nature of the struggle and it was not until, the buffalo had been hamstrung that the tiger had finally succeeded in pulling her down, in a fight which had lasted from 10 to 15 minutes. 
The tiger's tracks led across the ravine and, on following them up, I found a long smear of blood on a rock, and, a hundred yards further on, another smear on a fallen tree. The wound inflicted by the buffalo's horns was in the tiger's head and sufficiently severe to make the tiger lose all interest in the kill, for he never returned to it. Three years later the tiger, disregarding the lesson received when a cub, his excuse may have been that it was the close season for tigers, incautiously returned to a kill, over which a zamander and some of his tenants were sitting at night, and received a bullet in the shoulder which fractured the bone. No attempt was made to follow him up, and 36 hours later, his shoulder covered with a swarm of flies, he limped through the compound of the inspection bungalow, crossed a bridge flanked on the far side by a double row of tenanted houses, the occupants of which stood at the doors to watch him pass, entered the gate of a walled-in compound and took possession of a vacant go-down. 24 hours later, possibly alarmed by the number of people, who had collected from neighboring villages to see him, he left the compound the way he had entered it, passed our gate, and made his way to the lower end of our village. A bullock, belonging to one of our tenants, had died the previous night and had been dragged into some bushes at the edge of the village, this the tiger found, and here he remained a few days, quenching his thirst at an irrigation furrow. When we came down from the hills two months later, the tiger was living on small animals' calves, sheep, goats, etc. That he was able to catch on the outskirts of the village. By March his wound had healed, leaving his right foot turned inwards. Returning to the forest where he had been wounded, he levied heavy toll on the village cattle, taking, for safety's sake, but one meal off each and in this way killing five times as many as he would ordinarily have done. The Zamander, who had wounded him and who had a herd of some 400 head of cows and buffaloes was the chief sufferer. In the succeeding years he gained as much in size as in reputation, and many were the attempts made by sportsmen, and others, to bag him. One November evening, a villager, armed with a single-barrel muzzle-loading gun, set out to try to bag a pig, selecting for his ground macken an isolated bush growing in a 20-yard wide rocar dry watercourse running down the center of some broken ground. This ground was rectangular, flanked on the long sides by cultivated land and on the short sides by a road, and by a 10-foot canal that formed the boundary between our cultivation and the forest. In front of the man was a 4-foot high bank with a cattle track running along the upper edge, behind him a patch of dense scrub. At 8 p.m. an animal appeared on the track and, taking what aim he could, he fired. On receiving the shot the animal fell off the bank, and passed within a few feet of the man, grunting as it entered the scrub behind. Casting aside his blanket, the man ran to his hut 200 yards away. Neighbors soon collected and, on hearing the man's account, came to the conclusion that a pig had been hard hit. It would be a pity, they said, to leave the pig for hyenas and jackals to eat, so a lantern was lit and as a party of six bold spirits set out to retrieve the bag, one of my tenants, who declined to join the expedition, and who confessed to me later that he had no stomach for looking for wounded pig in dense scrub in the dark, suggested that the gun should be loaded and taken. His suggestion was accepted and, as a liberal charge of powder was being rammed home, the wooden ramrod jammed and broke inside the barrel. A trivial accident which undoubtedly saved the lives of six men. The broken rod was eventually and after great trouble extracted, the gun loaded, and the party set off. Arrived at the spot where the animal had entered the bushes, a careful search was made and, on blood being found, every effort to find the pig was made. It was not until the whole area had been combed out that the quest for that night was finally abandoned. Early next morning the search was resumed, with the addition of my informant of weak stomach, who was a better woodsman than his companions and who, examining the ground under a bush where there was a lot of blood, collected and brought some blood-stained hairs to me which I recognized as tiger's hairs. A brother sportsman was with me for the day and together we went to have a look at the ground. The reconstruction of jungle events, from signs on the ground has always held great interest for me. True, one's deductions are sometimes wrong, but they are also sometimes right. In the present instance I was right in placing the wound in the inner forearm of the right foreleg, but was wrong in assuming the leg had been broken and that the tiger was a young animal and a stranger to the locality. There was no blood beyond the point where the hairs had been found and, as tracking on the hard ground was impossible, I crossed the canal to where the cattle track ran through a bed of sand. 
Here from the pug marks I found that the wounded animal was not a young tiger as I had assumed, but my old friend the people Pani tiger who, when taking a shortcut through the village, had in the dark been mistaken for a pig. Once before when badly wounded he had passed through the settlement without harming man or beast, but he was older now, and if driven by pain and hunger might do considerable damage. A disconcerting prospect, for the locality was thickly populated, and I was due to leave within the week, to keep an engagement that could not be put off. For three days, I searched every bit of the jungle between the canal and the foothills, an area of about four square miles, without finding any trace of the tiger. On the fourth afternoon, as I was setting out to continue the search, I met an old woman and her son hurriedly leaving the jungle. From um, I learned that the tiger was calling near the foothills, and that all the cattle in the jungle had stampeded. When out with a rifle I invariably go alone, it is safer in a mix-up, and one can get through the jungle more silently. However, I stretched a point on this occasion, and let the boy accompany me since he was very keen on showing me where he had heard the tiger. Arrived at the foothills, the boy pointed to a dense bit of cover, bounded on the far side by the fire track to which I have already referred, and on the near side by the people Pani stream. Running parallel to and about a hundred yards, from the stream was a shallow depression some twenty feet wide, more or less open on my side and fringed with bushes on the side, nearer the stream. A well-used path crossed the depression at right angles. Twenty yards from the path, and on the open side of the depression, was a small tree. If the tiger came down the path he would in all likelihood stand for a shot on clearing the bushes. Here I decided to take my stand and, putting the boy into the tree with his feet on a level with my head and instructing him to signal with his toes, if from his raised position he saw the tiger before I did, I put my back to the tree and called. You, who have spent as many years in the jungle as I have, need no description of the call of a tigress in search of a mate, and to you less fortunate ones I can only say that the call, to acquire which necessitates close observation and the liberal use of throat salve, cannot be described in words. To my great relief, for I had crawled through the jungle for three days with finger on trigger, I was immediately answered from a distance of about 500 yards, and for half an hour thereafter, it may have been less and certainly appeared more, the call was tossed back and forth. On the one side the urgent summons of the king, and on the other, the subdued and coaxing answer of his handmaiden. Twice the boy signaled, but I had as yet seen nothing of the tiger, and it was not until the setting sun was flooding the forest, with golden light that he suddenly appeared, coming down the path at a fast walk with never a pause as he cleared the bushes. When halfway across the depression, and just as I was raising the rifle, he turned to the right and came straight towards me. This maneuver, unforeseen when selecting my stand, brought him nearer than I had intended he should come and, moreover, presented me with a headshot which at that short range I was not prepared to take. Resorting to an old device, learned long years ago and successfully used on similar occasions, the tiger was brought to a stand without being alarmed. With one paw poised, he slowly raised his head, exposing as he did so his chest and throat. After the impact of the heavy bullet, he struggled to his feet and tore blindly through the forest, coming down with a crash within a few yards of where, attracted by the calling of a cheetle hind the first of November morning, I had first seen his pug marks. It was only then that I found he had been shot under a misapprehension, for the wound which I feared might make him dangerous, proved on examination to be almost healed and caused by a pellet of lead, having severed a small vein in his right forearm pleasure at having secured a magnificent trophy. He measured 10 feet 3 inches over curves, and his winter coat was in perfect condition, was not unmixed with regret, for never again would the jungle folk and I, listen with held breath to his deep-throated call resounding through the foothills, and never again would his familiar pug marks show on the game paths that he and I, had trodden for 15 years. The End